We're going to take a historical look at crucifixion, which was a widespread form of punishment in antiquity. Our guest, John Dominic Crossan, is Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies at DePaul University and author of the books The Birth of Christianity, Jesus, A Revolutionary Biography, and Who Killed Jesus. Crossan describes his work as combining faith and history. He's a former Roman Catholic monk and the former co-chair of the Jesus Seminar, which investigates ancient historical evidence to help understand the life and times of Jesus. The seminar is controversial, in part because it does not take the Gospels literally and uses history to reconcile the different versions of Jesus' story as told in the four Gospels of the New Testament. Terry Gross spoke with John Dominic Crossan in 2004. He said crucifixion was practiced as a form of state terrorism for centuries before it became infamous under the Romans. Now, who were some of the people that were typically punished with crucifixion? In general, especially in the Roman situation, you can say almost definitely it was almost synonymous with the slaves' execution. It was a warning to other slaves not to flee, not to commit a crime, not, of course, to kill their, their master or mistress. And it was extremely public. Its point was not so much the amount of suffering, though, of course, it was a horrible suffering, but it was a public warning. You were literally hung up like a poster. Don't do what this person did or you'll end up as this person did. So very much for the lower classes and especially for slaves. Now, you say that during Roman times, crucifixion was one of three primary ways of capital punishment. There was crucifixion being burned alive and getting fed to the lions. The Romans talked about suprema supplicia, supreme penalties, and they really didn't calculate them in terms of the amount of suffering. They really calculated them in terms of annihilation, so being crucified, being <laughs> fed to the, to, to the beasts, as it were, are being burned alive, the function was there would be nothing left to bury. So even when they were finished with your corpse, the, the relatives, the loved ones, would have nothing to bury. There'd be no tomb where they could mourn, where they could come to grieve, where they could even, say, eat with the beloved dead. They wished to annihilate you and to do it publicly. Even with crucifixion? The, the theory behind crucifixion actually was that you would be left on the cross until you were consumed by wild beasts or wild animals. Now, we know, for example, that there was one case in the first century because we have found the heel bone of a crucified person with the nail still in place, and this person was buried, honorably buried. So it is possible, of course. It depends upon whether maybe you could bribe the guards or have enough influence to get the body given to you. Then you could get the body back. But in theory, the purpose of crucifixion was to leave the body there until there was nothing left. Was scourging or whipping usually the first step before crucifixion? In general, scourging preceded crucifixion, and the function of scourging was to reduce resistance. They did not want a person, for example, staggering through the streets with a crossbar, cursing Rome or fighting them all the way. What you wanted, this was public spectacle, what you wanted was somebody reduced to the state that the most it could do was stagger, as it were, to crucifixion, unresisting. So yes, usually scourging would have presumed, would have preceded crucifixion. How does Jesus' crucifixion, as described in the Gospels, compare with what is known historically about the, pro the, the, the procedures of crucifixion? In, in general, the crucifixion itself, and in a way the Gospel, has only one word. They crucified him. They don't describe the details that would show up, for example, in a play or a film. You don't have to decide if you're reading the gospel, does Jesus carry only the crossbar or does he pull a huge cross and upright already in position. It simply says it, it crucified him. Another thing it does tell you is that the, the crime, as it were, <laughs> the claim, the alleged claim of being king of the Jews was the sign given that you'd always have in a crucifixion saying this is what this person did. So the crime is as it were hung around his neck or attached to the cross in some way. But everything that's said about the crucifixion of Jesus would fit quite well into what you'd expect in a first century crucifixion. And it said he was scourged and it said he was mocked. The, the, the mocking is, is probably a separate issue. And in one sense, 
the mocking is is terribly ironic because he's been mocked as a pseudo king, and of course, any reader of the Christian New Testament, the Christian Gospel, believes profoundly that he was a king far more than Caesar was, or or Pilate as a local governor. That their mocking was profoundest truth. So the mock, in a way, the gospel spends far more time. If you count the verses, I think there's about four verses on the mocking, and there's only one single word in Greek for the scourging. They wanted to describe the mocking because of the tremendous irony that the soldiers mocked him as a king. I have no idea whether that is historical or not. They, they certainly could have, but the the point of insisting on it is the irony that he was being mocked as a king, and of course, we Christians who are reading this gospel believe him most profoundly to be king, not just of the Jews, but of the world. When did the cross become a symbol of Christianity? Very, 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 very slowly and cautiously. In the time before Constantine, that is, before the beginning of the 4th century, when Christianity became more or less the official religion of the Roman Empire, you have very, very many mentions, of course, from Paul's letters on of the cross, of the crucifixion, but you don't see pictures of it. The very earliest one we have, actually, of the crucifixion is, again, it's, we're back to the mocking, a page in the Palatine Palace in Rome was mocking a fellow page who apparently was a Christian. His name was Alexandrus. So the page scratched on the wall of their their dormitory, as it were, a model of the crucifixion in which Jesus is portrayed with the head of a donkey. And written underneath it is, Alexander worships his God. And probably that's the only way it would have been shown as a mocking of the crucifixion until after the victory of Constantine. Have you thought about if so many people were crucified, if it was such a common form of execution. Why did that become the symbol uh, for Jesus Christ? The crucifix only became, or the cross, only became the symbol for Jesus always, always as accompanied by the resurrection. I mean, this is two things, execution, resurrection, Mm -hmm. death, resurrection, always the two things. Because, of course, the point is that Jesus was officially, legally, publicly executed by Rome. It wasn't that Pilate made a mistake or that Pilate simply was rounding up people and he he grabbed Jesus by by mistake. Jesus was executed by the normal sea of the civilization of his day. Then, of course, when you say that God raised Jesus from the dead, you've got two things on a collision course. Rome crucified Jesus. God raised Jesus. Then the inference is very clear. This God we're talking about is on a collision course with Rome because God had, as it were, countermanded the official decree of Rome. And so if you take away the the resurrection, then the crucifixion becomes almost meaningless or you have to get into another theology in which the crucifixion is, is the center of Christianity all by itself. When, when, when you, as a, as someone who studies the historical Jesus, think about the resurrection, do you think about it as metaphor or as actuality? I think of it, I would not make the distinction of metaphor or actuality. I would make the distinction of metaphor or literal, because metaphors can be very actual. For example, the metaphor for me is that to claim resurrection for Jesus, and I can leave it completely whether you take it metaphorically or literally, either way, what you are claiming is that something has happened here which is going to change the way the world sees everything. And I think that is right, because the claim you're making is that God has reversed the normalcy of civilization. And that's why it's very important for me to insist that Pilate, from his point of view, got it right. He, he looked at Jesus He said, this person resists our law and order, as it were, not a violent resistor, or I'd have rounded up all his followers like I rounded up Barabbas's. But yes, he resists us, and therefore he must be publicly executed. Now, to say that God has reversed that decision puts God on a collision course with the normalcy of civilization. That, I believe, is actual, because I believe in 
what happened at the death of Jesus is that we were confronted with a warning that violence is going to destroy us. We got a warning that if you do not resist evil nonviolently, violence will destroy us. I think something did happen because that was a warning and we have not been heeding it for 2,000 years. With, with the resurrection, do you think that there was some kind of um, physical transformation that happened to the actual body of Jesus? No, I don't. I am completely convinced that Jesus had told people bef before his death that the kingdom of God has already arrived and that we have begun to participate with God in what I'm going to call the great cleanup. The fancy word for that is eschatological consummation. The great cleanup of the world, the attempt to make it a just place. I am absolutely certain also, historically I'm speaking, that people had visions of Jesus after his execution. They had visions, I'm not saying, they are not hallucinations. They are visions, they are apparitions of Jesus. When they put those two things together, they said, then Jesus has risen as the beginning of the general resurrection. That's the only thing the word could have meant to them. It's not a personal, private privilege for Jesus. He has risen as the head of those who have died before him and as the promise of those who will die after him. I take that metaphorically. I do not take it actually. I do not think all around Jerusalem on Easter Sunday morning there were hundreds of empty tombs. And I don't think the people who believed in the harrowing of hell ever suggested, let's go out and check the tombs of the prophets to see if they're gone. I think they knew quite well what they were saying. They were saying something which they took metaphorically and which we take literally and I think we've kind of lost the actuality. I know that you've seen Mel Gibson's movie, uh, The Passion of the Christ, and I I'm, I'm wondering if you could give us your short review of how the Jesus story is told in the movie. Basically, there's a couple of things that, that any passion story or passion drama does. You take the four Gospels, and there are four of them, by the way, and you reduce them to one. And then you reduce that one Gospel to simply execution and then you reduce that execution to passio, the Latin word for passion, um, meaning suffering. So everything coalesces on the suffering of Jesus. Therefore, for example, there is nothing in Mel Gibson's movie, except brief flashbacks, more to increase the poignancy about the life of Jesus. So by the time you come to the execution, and the resurrection, of course, is even more fleeting in, in this movie, you have no idea why anyone, anyone at all, would want this person dead, let alone executed publicly. You don't even understand it.